All right, hello everyone. It's Wednesday, March 2nd. Welcome to V Brown Bag. Tonight we are kicking off the first of our CCNA DC series, and we are going to be focusing on section one, which is describing how a network works. Uh, a couple notes before handing it over to our presenter tonight, Brian Trainer. Uh, we will be following along with the conversation as we go, so feel free to tweet us using the V Brown Bag account or by using the V Brown Bag Twitter hashtag. Uh, if you are live, we'll also be paying attention to the chat and question windows, too. Uh, so uh, a couple other things. We are also uh, going to talk about the V Brown Bag series coming up in uh, APAC, and uh, that's on Thursdays at 10 p.m. NZDT. Uh, EMEA, which will also be uh, hosting some of these CCNA DC topics. Those are Tuesdays at 7 p.m. BST time. Uh, LATAM, which is every Thursday at 7 p.m. Pacific, and then U.S., well, that's us tonight on Wednesdays. Uh, so without further ado, our presenter tonight is Brian Trainer. He's on Twitter at B.E. Trainer, and uh, we appreciate him jumping on and starting the series off. Uh, one last thing, I am Kyle Ruddy. I'm your host tonight. You can find me on Twitter at K.M. Ruddy as well. Uh, and I'll also be following all the, the V Brown Bag uh, account and the hashtags. So, uh, Brian, let me get uh, presenter rights over to you. And uh, we can go. Change presenter. Okay. And hopefully you just got a little pop up. I sure did. Yep. And I can see your PowerPoint now. Fantastic. All right. Well, thank you, Kyle. I appreciate that. And, and welcome, everyone. So, yes, uh, we are starting off the, uh, the CCNA Data Center series, uh, starting with uh, objective number one. So happy to, uh, to jump in and, and uh, kick this off. Um, so a little bit who I am. Uh, some of you might not know who I am. Um, I have been around the community, but uh, I, I tend to keep a, a fairly low profile. Uh, I am a senior systems engineer with uh, Unicom Systems. We're a, a, a Cisco and VMware partner in the probably North Carolina area. Um, on Twitter as BE Trainer. And uh, but tonight, yeah, I decided to just go ahead and uh, kind of break out of that, um, you know, kind of that low profile image here and and um, really step up and, and uh, kick off uh, the, these presentations and and um, and I'm, I'm not doing this one of these uh, so Jonathan then asked if if I would be willing to do the first two and so I foolishly uh, said yes and uh, so I'll, you'll listen to me uh, both tonight and next week so uh, this should be uh, should be a pretty fun series so uh, again we're uh, we're going we're kicking off the uh, the data center series and uh, just um, uh, since this is the, the very first one, I'm just going to go through just a, a few quick study resources. Um, and by the way, I, I just a quick disclaimer. Um, <clears throat> I am a, uh, I'm a VMware engineer, uh, I guess technically a systems engineer, so I really don't know a whole lot about networking. Okay? Now, I, I say that partly in jest. Uh, I, I, I've, I've been around data centers uh, for a long time and, and IT shops. Uh, but networking was always my my weak area, and so the last couple of years I decided I needed to to fill in the gaps and, and really strengthen that area so that so I had a, a much more complete picture of the the whole infrastructure stack. And so set out to uh, to achieve my my CCNA route switch. So I got that, and in the process of doing that, there was a lot of uh, gaps that were filled in, a lot of uh, um, those light bulb moments where finally I was able to see. What what was going on underneath the, the, the surface uh, all these years that I've been working with systems. And so uh, with that, um, the, the data center is, the, the data center track is another one of my goals for this year. So I figured what better way to be able to, to learn this than to jump in and, uh, and present on a couple of these topics. So, uh, so a great starting point for studying is uh, Cisco's own website, the, um, their certification page. And so if we just go there real quick, or just uh, take a, just a quick look at, at some of the things that they have to offer here. Uh, so if you go down to the, uh, the data center, CCNA data center link there, and there's, there's quite a number of um, great resources in here. If you wanted to just scroll through here, there's some great training videos and, and um, some other items in here. And, um, certainly 
take a look at that. The syllabus, you always, of course, want to make sure that you get a, a um, take a look at the blueprint. Um, there's, uh, again, there, there's some other good uh, resources in here. Make sure that, that, you, that you go through uh, what, what Cisco has, uh, especially on their Cisco Learning Network. There's a lot of great resources, and I highly, highly, highly recommend either joining a study group or at least looking at the, um, the comments that show up in the forums. Uh, you get a lot of great information from other people who have taken the, the exam, who have uh, you know, discovered what, what study resources uh, work, I mean, as far as uh, which ones are the better ones to, to pull from uh, for your studying, uh, and then also where there might be gaps in the blueprint, okay? And hint, hint, there, there are some gaps that uh, apparently uh, Cisco is not very thorough in, in putting together all of the things that you really need to know. Um, so anyway, you'll, you'll see a lot of that in the forum. So again, high recommendation for, for checking those out. Uh, so as far as just some other uh, resources, there's some great books out there. Uh, Wendell Odom, um, the Cisco Press book, uh, he and, and then Todd Lamley, uh, both of those guys have, have uh, put together some, um, historically have put together some great uh, uh, study guides for the Cisco exams. Uh, I think the jury is out as far as which one of those would be better for this particular exam. Um, I, I've heard both people swear by one or the other. Um, but one, I guess, a general uh, uh, or a general uh, thought that I've heard is that neither one of these books is going to completely uh, prepare you for everything that you'll need on the exam. Okay, so a lot of that is is just going to be hands-on experience, and so. With, uh, as far as that, we know that with these types of exams, you really have to have some kind of face time, some kind of, uh, you know, real, um, you know, practice, real experiential knowledge of the, the commands and the, um, uh, and just actually being able to, to walk through and, and uh, um, do, do some of the, um, uh, some of the concepts that, uh, that, that, are, that, that are covered in the, the exam. Uh, but as far as the hands-on, I just wanted to point out, so uh, this is the data center track, and with the data center, this is, we're talking about uh, the Nexus gear, okay? Nexus gear, uh, these are very expensive pieces of electronics. If you happen to have one of those just lying around to be able to, to fire up and to play on, then absolutely go nuts. I mean, this is, you know, you're, you're very fortunate to be able to have that. If you don't have that, uh, then then there, there are other options to be able to play and, and to learn some of these concepts. And the Nexus 1000D is a great uh, resource. Uh, there's, there's a free version available. I think most of us probably on this call have, uh, have our own vSphere labs. So you can spin this up and you can at least uh, get a, a, acquainted with some of the NXOS uh, commands. Uh, there's also Viral out there. It's a great uh, resource from what I've heard. I personally have not tried that, uh, but it's a, uh, apparently that's one of the, the newer resources available. Uh, I have heard that it's a resource hog, so keep that in mind. It's also, uh, I, can, I think it comes with a price point of, I think, 200 bucks. So you know, there, there's a cost there. And there's other things. Uh, some of the, the training sites like INE have rack rentals. They can be pretty pricey, but again, they, you can still get some hands-on experience. Uh, some other great online training resources, Pluralsight. Uh, we, we, we all know uh, Chris Wall, who put together a great series, uh, data center series. Uh, CBT Nuggets had some good videos, INE, and then, of course, a very own V Brown bag. Um, Tom Hollingsworth did a, a couple uh, great videos a couple years ago. So let's go ahead and dive right in. This is uh, the very first objective. Uh, and, and I'm going to do this in a little bit different, um, different order than, than the way that it's listed on the, the blueprint. Uh, so we're going to start with uh, exam objective 1.4, and excuse me, I'm going to go and uh, before I before I jump into this, just want to kind of set up set the stage here that what we're going to learn tonight is a lot of the intro to networking. Okay, it's it's uh, you know we're we're not really getting into much of the the NXOS uh, today. Um, you know we will see some of that next week, uh, but a lot of this is just laying the foundation. So just kind of keep that in mind. Uh, a lot of the, the, the things that we'll look at are, are really going to be conceptual in nature. And of course, as we started off, what can be more conceptual than the OSI model? 
Okay, I know there are groans going out all over the land. Everybody loves the OSI model, right? Okay, so the OSI model is is our kind of our basis of the you know understand, being able to understand the framework of what's what's going on underneath the surface. And the as far as the OSI model, this is um, everybody you know just has a has a hard time I think when they they first start to try to learn this OSI model. It's uh, hard to get your your uh, your mind you know wrapped around this, um, but I I firmly believe that it's it's a great way of, of helping us to uh, to categorize and understand the different functions within the network. Okay, so uh, it, it was put together by the um, the ISO back in the I think it was the late 70s and and they they, they put it together in, in for really for the reason of of being able to uh, to help uh, vendors or network devices from other vendors to be able to talk to each other, because what they were trying to do is standardize what's happening at each each layer or each portion of the network. So this really allowed other vendors to be able to to um, really develop protocols and devices that would that would really meet a standard specification at each of these levels. Okay, so. Basically, what they were doing is, uh, is uh, creating a, uh, a model so that uh, as we develop these, we're developing for you know again these these particular um, standards, but also allowed it to for those of us who are working with in these environments, made it less complex. You know, we could understand you know what this particular device was doing because it was working in in uh, say layer three. We had a better idea of what's what's actually happening in layer three. So it, it then became easier to troubleshoot issues that came up. Say if they were, if we knew that it was a layer three issue, we knew that we could we could go and and really focus on what the protocols and and and, and the, the various functions that were happening at that layer. Okay, so anyway, it's it, for us. I, I think it'll be easier for us to learn the rest of the, the concepts of this, you know, networking kind of these these intro to networking concepts if we have a good basis of what's, um, you know, what to uh, and how to break the, the, the network functions down. Okay, so uh, you'll see here that I've got uh, uh, seven layers, and I'm just going to kind of run through each of these layers, just kind of giving you an idea of what happens at each layer. So, layer seven, application layer. This is the this is going to be your interface between the network services and the application. Okay, it's and the um, what we're what we're seeing here is not so much the well, it's not the application that lives in this this layer. It's the application services. Okay, so we think about services such as SMTP, HTTP, FTP. Um, you know, there's there's all kinds of services or, or, or protocols that uh, that work at this layer that interface with the application. Okay, uh, so next layer, presentation. We're looking here at the the data formats. Uh, basically, um, the, how we define those data formats: ASCII, binary. Um, you know, it's how we how we do the code formatting or the data translation. Okay, um, you know, a, a lot of that is is still uh, um, uh, really beyond my understanding. Uh, you know, this is the presentation and session are, are two of the layers that we're really not going to spend a whole lot of time with. But I just know that for this is really how kind of the, the data is presented. Okay, uh, we go down to the the session layer. We're talking about starting, controlling, ending conversations. Uh, establishing, managing, and terminating sessions uh, between uh, these applications. How to keep the, uh, the the sessions isolated from one another. Okay. Now those three layers are I, I, I color coded them orange just to you know separate them from the lower four. Those upper three layers are layers that we're really not going to spend that much time in. Okay. We're, we're gonna we will spend a, a you know we, we will of course have to understand what's happening in the application layer. Uh, with the particular protocols that um, you know, like HTTP, um, but we're but as networking professionals, we're really going to be spending most of our time down in the lower four uh, layer. So transport, we're talking about end-to-end -end connections. Okay, this is the uh, really defines the the state of the connection between two network nodes. 
or two devices to uh, host on the network. Uh, we're going to be talking about uh, such things as air recovery and flow control and um, basically creating the, the reliable connections. Uh, network. Here we're talking about the logical addressing. Okay, what do we mean by that? Well, yeah, today in our our uh, our network, so using TCP/IP, we're, we're talking about IP addresses. Okay, routing goes on in this layer, uh, determining the best best path. Okay, um, you know uh, the, the devices that work at this layer, routers, uh, they learn the possible routes and choose the best route. Okay, we go down to the data link layer. There we're talking about the physical addressing. There, that is the the hardware addresses or or the MAC addresses. Okay, um, and we're talking about transferring data frames from uh, you know one node on the network to another. Okay, but all of this is local network. And then physical, we're talking about uh, this is defined in the physical uh, the physical characteristics of the the the, the media, the network media, so the cabling. Uh, um, as far as you know, the um, uh, the, the specifications, the, you know, the the cable length or the wire strands or the uh, the electrical pulses, uh, those types of things that actually have to do with the physical media between your network nodes. Okay, now um, for the exam, you will need to know all that. We're going to go uh, spend a little bit more time on the, those lower four. Uh, layers, but but you do still need to know all of these. I mean, as far as the the names of all of them, and so we we've come up with a couple different mnemonics to to be able to help remember them. Uh, if you go from layer seven to layer one, it's the you know the the usual one is all people seem to need data processing. Okay. Uh, if you go the other way, layers one to seven, please do not throw sausage pizza away. Okay. These are just great fun little ways to remember the the names of each of those layers. Okay, so if we uh, spend a little bit more time with with each of the four layers, four lower layers. Okay, we're, uh, we we do need to know what the data units are called in each one of those layers, the different protocols and specifications that are are um, that work at each of those layers, and then the different devices that you'll typically find at those layers. Okay, so uh, layer one, again, we're just talking about the the physical media between. Uh, the two network nodes, and what happens? The, the the data units at that layer are just bits. Those are ones and zeros, right? So when when we connect our cable into a, a network device, and it's sending traffic across there, it's sending them in just ones and zeros. Those are just little bits that, that are going across that wire. Uh, so as far as specifications, we're looking at you know these are these are cable specifications RJ45 or or some of the protocols like Ethernet uh, you know or the the physical specifications of uh, that are defined um, by the Ethernet standards uh, and then as far as the devices cabling uh, repeater hub we'll, we'll get into those devices in a little bit um, but but keep in for each one of these little these four layers just keep in mind each of these categories and and what is associated to each layer. Okay, layer two, we're looking at data link. Uh, the, the data units here are the frames, okay, and, and basically what's happening is that the, the data is getting uh, framed by the, say, the, uh, the Ethernet header and trailer, okay. Those are, those are layer two frames, okay. These are not layer two packets. Packets happen to the layer three, all right, but that's to remember the data unit at this point is, are their frames. Uh, some of the protocols, Ethernet, uh, HDLC, PPP, frame relay, some of those are, are the WAN um, protocols. Uh, but but that's all, those are the types of, of protocols that, that will be taking place in layer two. Some of the devices, bridge, switch, um, wireless access point. Um, and, and we'll, again, we'll, we'll get into uh, some of the, um, you know, more in depth look at some of these devices in a little bit. Uh, it turns out that data link is, is uh, sectioned off into two layers. Uh, there's two sub-layers, the logical link, which actually interfaces with the the layer three, the networking function, and the MAC layer that interfaces with the, the physical medium as far as putting data on the wire. It, it handles the, the, the hardware addressing. So then we go up the stack to layer three. Layer three, the, the data units there are packets, okay? protocols, your IP address, some of the uh, sub-protocols of IP, ICMP, IGMP. Uh, there's routing protocols that, um, that take place at this, uh, this layer. And then 
we're looking at routers, uh, layer three switches, and we're talking about into VLAN routing. Uh, that happens here at layer three. Layer four, uh, here are the data units are segments. Uh, protocols, TCP, UDP, we're going to look into those quite a bit more in a little bit, and some of the, the various devices, firewalls particularly. Uh, so one point to remember with, with transport is what we're, what one of the, the big um, units that we uh, are probably already familiar with in the transport layer are ports, port numbers. Okay, we know a lot of the common port numbers, port 80 is HTTP, port 25 is SMTP. Uh, so a lot of those we're, we're already familiar with, those are geared toward transport, the transport layer. Okay, and, and we're, we're going to see why that is in a little bit. But so think about firewalls. Think about the rules that are in place on firewalls. Oftentimes they're looking at the port. Okay, can't let uh, say FTP traffic through, so it's going to it's going to block up port 21. Okay, so that's all happening there at, at the uh, the transport layer, and then. Continuing on up, layer seven, the application layer, some of the different protocols. Uh, of course, you know, all of these are, are ones that we're fairly familiar with. Uh, and, uh, and again, those are the, the protocols that are really interfacing with the, the uh, application that's there on, say, the, uh, the user's application. Um, so the devices, uh, of course, hosts, okay, your computer is, you know, that's operating there at the application layer oftentimes firewalls well as well. Okay, so that was the OSI model. Here we're, we're going to throw another model in as well, and that's the TCP IP model. Okay, this was, was uh, put forth by the Department of Defense uh, in the, the late 80s, I think is when they, they started working on this. Um, I, I believe that it was part of the whole ARPANET. Um, it, eventually, this became the... Um, the architectural model for TCP IP as we know it today. So TCP IP is, you know, we know that that is the de facto standard for uh, networks throughout the world. It's, it's the most predominantly used network architecture. And so the model that it's really based off of is this model. It's sometimes called the internet model. And, and if we compare this with, say, the OSI model, put the two together, you'll see how the TCP IP model uh, how it maps to the various layers there of the OSI model. Okay, application, you're basically cramming the application presentation and session into one layer, which is good because that's kind of how we're going to look at those upper layers. It's just, hey, that's the application. Uh, transport, everything that, that we talked about as far as the transport layer, OSI, same thing in the TCP IP. Uh, internet layer, that maps directly with layer three of the OSI. And then your network access is, of course, mapping to the data link physical. So, but what's interesting though is that, so we use the TCP IP model as the architecture for our networks throughout the world, but yet we still use the terminology from OSI as far as when we talk about layer two, layer three switches, um, you know, layer four protocols, we're talking about concepts from the OSI. And we might be applying them to architecture that's, that's built from the TCP IP model, but it's still that old terminology. And you might even see that, that some TCP IP models actually merge the two. So it's a network access might uh, actually be shown with physical and data link uh, in, in, in place of that. So in any case, that's, uh, so that, that's a uh, kind of a quick o overview of the, the reference models that we use in our, our networks. And one of the things I wanted to do here is um, just because I, I, I look at this as being a very abstract uh, thing to really wrap my brain around, right? And so uh, this, this is a, a very, both of these models are very conceptual, um, but how do we, how can we actually take this and make it a little bit more concrete? And so, um, so I wanted to just pull up uh, just a quick little Wireshark uh, capture here. And I just wanted to just, um, I, I'm actually going to be pulling a Wireshark in for, uh, uh, just to point out some of the different concepts that we're going to be looking at tonight. But um, uh, so if we look at just, you know, one of these uh, frames that I captured, and we look through this little section, this midsection right here, we can see that each of those layers that we talked about as far as the, the physical, the data link, the net, uh, the, um, yeah, the network and the transport, 
that each of those are represented here. And so we can actually see what is happening at each of those layers. So we look at that layer one. Okay, this is all just the bits that we were just talking about. Okay, layer two. All right, well, that's the, you know, we're talking about the data link. We're talking about uh, basically the, the data that's, that's going from one node on a local network to another. Okay, it's all happening within the local area network. Well, what's happening here is that it's, it's uh, you know, what we can see here that it's, it's, it's uh, pulling in or it's showing us the physical address, the, the source and destination address of this layer. Okay, that's, that's your MAC address. Uh, layer three, your IP addresses. And then layer four, your, your, uh, your port numbers, your source and destination port numbers. Okay, there's some other information in there as well. But, but I, as soon as I, I, I realized that uh, Wireshark had, that this is what Wireshark did, and, and there's, there's you know, lots of, of things that you can do with, with Wireshark, but, but how it was breaking the, the packets or breaking the frames down so that I could actually see what was going on at each layer. A lot of these, these uh, the, you know, the, the, uh, the concepts from the OSI layer, or OSI model, uh, really started to come to life. And especially when we started talking about encapsulation and de-encapsulation, which is what we'll talk about here next. Um, so I'm, I'll pull this back in a little bit. But um, so if we move on to the next objective, uh, we're, when we're talking about data flow, we are going to be talking about some of that encapsulation and de-encapsulation. Okay. So, uh, but real quick, just a, a high level or just a quick uh, kind of view of what's happening when a a uh, you see your laptop, you're, you're on your laptop and you're connecting to it, a, a, you know, a, some data or some application on the, uh, on the network. Uh, you're connecting to another device. And um, so the, the data flow here, as, as your data gets sent through the application layer, it's, it's essentially going to go down through each of the lower layers, you know, you know in, in sequence. And then once it gets down to the data link layer, it then gets put onto your, your uh, the uh, network medium, so that would be your, your cable, that could be uh, getting sent across uh, the wireless. Um, and, but once it gets to the other side, it's then going to then come back up through the layers and through the application layer and then uh, get presented to the, uh, to the receiving end. Now, that still really doesn't tell us anything, right? Again, what, what's going on there? Well, it's this encapsulation and de-encapsulation process. So when it's going down through the layers, so on this side, as it's going through those layers, there's information that's getting added to each, uh, at, at each point, okay? So the application is gonna send data through the application layer as it, as it hits the, uh, the, the transport layer. So the, all the, the the functionality there at the transport layer, the uh, there is a, uh, a header that's added to that data. Okay, in this case we're we're using that TCP for the transport protocol. The TCP header is is added to that data. Okay, that is then handed down to the network layer, and at that point the uh, the uh, logical address is added as a header. Okay, so in this case, it's your IP address. The source and the destination IP address will get added to that. So if you are pinging, or if you're trying to reach a uh, server at uh, 10.3.1.2, okay, that will be the destination IP address that shows, or destination logical address that shows up in that IP header. And then that gets handed down to the data link layer. And at that point, this is where you are, uh, you're, in, in this case, we're using Ethernet as the, the protocol standard here. And so we will have the Ethernet header and trailer in this case. The trailer will basically have your, your error detection or, or your control um, information on that. And the, the header then will have a source and destination hardware address or the MAC address. Okay. So this whole process of adding these headers and then the trailer, that's, that's the process of, it, of encapsulation. And so then that gets put on, on the wire as, as ones and zeros, little bits. And then when it gets to the other side, to the receiving side, the, the, uh, the header and the trailer of, of the data link, that's stripped away. The, um, 
the IP header or the, the network header is stripped away. Anyway, it moves up through the layers, uh, and then that data is then presented to the application on the receiving end. Now, so again, if we pull in Wireshark and take a look at those headers real quick, we'll see if we look at the – actually, just grab another one here. If we look at this particular frame here and at the – actually, let's, let's start at the layer 4, okay? This is the, the header information that we see at layer 4. So it's got our source port number, our destination port number, and it's got some other information, our sequence and acknowledgement. Okay, I'll, I'll talk about that in a little bit. Uh, and then as far as the port numbers, this is, uh, all has to do with the uh, transport layers of multiplexing ability. Again, we'll talk about that in a bit. But still, this is, this is the header information that's, that's put on that data, okay, the payload, uh, before it gets sent down through the, the, uh, the lower layers. So that's our transport layer, our network layer. Well, here's the – this down here represents the, the header. And by the way, down in this, this little section down here, each of these pairs of, of characters is a – that represents one byte or eight bits of information. Okay, so here this is you know, it's, it's a good sizable header at the uh, at the I, or at the layer three. Layer two, you've got both the header. I'm sorry, you've got the header as well as the trailer. Okay, notice how that's framing the rest of of the uh, the data there, and then the layer one. That encompasses the entire frame, and again, that's all of this represents the bits that are then going out onto the, um, the media. Okay, so that's those are the headers and trailer that make up this process of encapsulation. So then, if we look at something like IP and what's happening when we send a say, if we're pinging a a device, let's say I ping. Uh, 8.8.8.8. .8 okay, we know that ping is is well. That's that's actually what they that, that starts at the uh, layer three. Okay, it starts at the network layer. Um, and and so when we when we send a ping, okay, that's basically uh, setting up a, a an IP packet. And what's happening is if I if I'm pinging 8.8.8.8, .8 .8, I know that that's not on my network. And so my machine, my laptop's going to notice that, okay, it, it needs to go to my default gateway, okay? And so it needs to know, it, it's going to find out what the MAC address is for the local uh, network interface of my router, and it, it's going to put that IP packet into an Ethernet, uh, or into a frame that an Ethernet header will have my source and destination MAC address. So it'll have my source MAC address and then the MAC address of the local interface of the router. So it's going to encapsulate that IP packet with the destination IP of 8.8.8.8. .8 .8 .8. It's going to put that, it's going to into, it's going to frame that with the data link header and trailer. And then it's going to send it down the wire in ones and zeros can go through my switch. My switch will see that uh, the MAC address is XXX, and it knows that it needs to go out, say, port 23, to get to that interface on the router. Router is going to grab it. It's going to see the the MAC address. It'll see that it owns the destination MAC address, and so it'll take that frame. It'll strip the the header and the trailer off to take a look at to inspect the IP packet. It'll see that the destination IP address is 8.8.8.8, .8 .8 and it'll say, okay, it's it's not on, it, it's none of my local interfaces. I'm I'm going to send it out the default route, and it'll send it out. It, it'll it'll prepare it to send it out on the the link that that's going to uh, link up with its ISP. And so at that point, it's then going to encapsulate that IP packet back into a layer two frame with the MAC address or the hardware address of the next hop at the ISP. And so that, that process of encapsulation and de-encapsulation is going to go on 
you know, at every hop until that IP packet gets to its destination, gets to 8.8.8.8. .8 and then, of course, then the return will, will reverse the, the whole process. Okay, so that's, that's our data flow for, uh, for IP as far as what's happening there um, at, at the various layers. Okay, so if we move on to the layer four, protocols, we're looking at TCP and, and, um, and UDP, okay? Now, let's first talk about some of the, the or let's talk about the, the layer four features that, um, that are, are, are features of TCP, okay? TCP is, is very often considered the, um, basically the reliable connection, okay? It's, uh, we talk about there's a concept called connection-oriented uh, protocols. Okay, these are these are protocols that that need that require some kind of a reliable connection to make sure that there's no loss of data, to make sure that um, that the data flows through in, in a um, in such a way that um, that it's going to be received on the the destination end intact. And so there there's a number of features that um, that encompass this uh, the, the protocol uh, TCP, and and so I've listed here the, just the the different features, and and we'll we'll look at each one of these. But so the first one there is multiplexing using ports. Okay, we're we're all fairly familiar with uh, again the whole concept of of ports, um, say port 80 being HTTP, uh, you know SMTP 25, and so forth. So what uh, may not be as um, as obvious is that when we send data to say a web server, okay, what's happening there at the transport layer is our destination port is say port 80, all right, um, because we are, uh, you know, that's our, our web server is using HTTP, our, our our client is using that to access the web server which has that port open. Well, on our source uh, port is going to be some other port number that, you know, it could be a random port number. It could be, say, you know, 5,000, okay? That is going to be our source port. So basically, we're looking at a, a connection that's established with that web server in which my source port is 5,000, the destination port is 80, okay? Now, I can have multiple web uh, multiple browsers open to that same web server. And if I start uh, browsing different pages at the same time from those different browsers, the data will be returned to the correct browser. And the way it does that is because that source port is going to be different for each of those browser sessions. So browser session one will have port 5000 as its source port. Browser session two will have 6000 as its source port and so on. And so when the data comes back, the, the data will come back as the destination port 5000, source port 80, destination port 5000. So it's going back to the correct application. And so that's where the, these ports are used to be able to make sure that the connection is, is, um, is allowing the data to go back to the, the proper application um, and to make sure that there's that, again, that reliable connection, okay? Uh, so, uh, if we continue on here, we're looking at the um, uh, connection establishment and termination. We, I, I keep on saying reliable. Well, the reason that we have, we create a reliable connection using TCP is because of a really, um, here, it's a three-way handshake that occurs right before data starts to transfer. So, host A wants to talk to host B. Okay, let's say Alice is at A. Uh, Bob is at B, and and, and uh, Alice wants to talk to Bob. Basically, what's happening here is there's there's a return of information or an exchange of information that is setting up a a conversation. So Alice can say, "Hey, Bob, do you have time to talk?" And Bob says, "Sure, I do. Let me know when you're ready." She says, "Oh, I'm ready right now." And then they can start talking. Okay. So, and what's happening here is that there is a, a segment that goes across from host A to host B. It's, it's basically a SYN. We call it a SYN. Um, the return is a SYNAC, and, and then the, the third 
exchange is an ACK. Basically, what's happening there is host A is saying, "Hey, I, I want to um, I want to synchronize our sequence numbers." Okay, and and I'll I'll touch on those sequence numbers here in a moment. Host B is saying, "Okay, hey, I acknowledge that. Um, I want to you know here, let's let's set up these uh, connection uh, parameters and and I want you to, to synchronize with me as well. Host A says, great, I acknowledge that, you know, now we're ready to go. Okay, so that kind of, that three-way handshake has to take place before data really starts moving across the wire, okay. So, uh, layer four, we, uh, another item there is order data transfer. Um, basically, we're talking about making sure that, that data is, is properly sequenced and, and uh, so that when it's received on the other side, it's properly, uh, again, properly sequenced and uh, making sure that all of the data segments are, are in place. Um, let's take a look at error recovery, okay? So what's happening here is that uh, host A is, it sends, it sends uh, basically a, a sequence of, of um, basically a byte stream, okay? It's sending, and it's, and it's calling it sequence 1000, okay? Host B will will receive that, uh, that that sequence of data and say, "Hey, I got that," and it's going to send basically this uh, this forward. They call it a forward acknowledgement. Uh, it's acknowledging that uh, that he that host B received the data, and it's saying, "Okay, I received your data, and I'm now I'm ready for sequence 2000." So it sends an ACK equals 2000. Jose receives that and says, great, here's, here's the next stream of data starting with sequence 2000. Now, let's say host B doesn't send anything. There's no acknowledgement. Well, sequence, or I mean host A then realizes, oh, host B probably didn't get that, meaning that those packets or those frames, the, those bits were lost somehow. So it sends, a, it sends that again, it sends sequence 2000. Uh, host B says, got it. I acknowledge I'm going to you know send my forward acknowledgement to you and then asking you to to start with 3000 so host A gets it says great and now I'm going to send you C1 3000 okay so basically what this is doing is it's making sure that all of the data is properly sent between host A and host B so if, if any data is dropped host A will know and then it can resend the data okay. um, and then finally, the, uh, there's, uh, there's a concept called flow control. And what that is, is uh, host B has the ability, if, if, if it starts to receive data too quickly from host A, then it can say, whoa, hold on, you're sending me data way too fast, I need you to slow down a little bit. Or the reverse, it could be, uh, hey, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm receiving your data, but you know I've got I've got a lot more bandwidth you can use. Why don't you start sending me more data uh, you know, at a at a time? And basically, what we're doing is it helps the efficiency. So data is sent in basically like little blocks, okay? And you know, we, we the, the 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 term here is is windowing. Uh, um, it's it's basically the amount of data that's being sent at a time between acknowledgments. So as data gets sent from host A to host B, um, it can host B can receive that data. It can receive a certain amount of data before it's going to send an acknowledgement. Okay, we don't need to send an acknowledgement for every single bit of data that goes across. Okay. Here's my my little diagram of what's happening with flow control. Host A saying, okay, well I've got. Uh, I, I'm working with a window of, let's say, 1,000 bytes. Okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to send you host B 1,000 bytes, starting with sequence 1,000. Okay, host B receives that and says, hey, I got it. I'm going to acknowledge that I got it, asking you to send me uh, the next stream of data with, starting with sequence 2,000. And, and by the way, you can send me more data. Why don't you send me, why don't you increase your window to 1100 and send 1100 bytes of data? Host A says, great. Okay, I'm going to start now with a window of 1100. I'm going to send you, starting with sequence 2000, send you 1100 bytes. Host B receives that and says, yep, got it. I'm going to send you my acknowledgement and you can start your next sequence starting at 3100. And by the way, you can increase your window to 1200. 
Okay, and so it's just going to keep on going through this, and you can do the math there. But but what it's doing, it, it gives Hostia a chance to say, hey, send me more, I can handle it. Or if its buffers are getting overflown, then it can say, well, slow down, you know, decrease your window. I can't take that much at a time. Okay, so it's a great way of of um, the the receiver, the the destination host, to be able to control the amount of data that's uh, that's getting sent. Okay, so you can see that there's a lot that's going on here at the TCP level, or at the transport level, using TCP. Um, the, uh, the, the, the header that is used to handle all of this, this type of information, it's a 20 byte header, okay? That's, that's fairly significant. Um, so TCP is a reliable connection, but there is more processing that has to go on in order to, um, you know, to handle all of the, those reliability checks, okay? That there's, there's a price to pay. It, it can use more bandwidth. But again, it creates a, a, that reliable connection that, you know, so much of our data transmission requires, okay? Now, UDP, on the other hand, on the other hand UDP is, a, is considered an unreliable data transport protocol, okay? It does still do the multiplexing using ports. So you can have multiple sessions open or multiple uh, you know, applications open and, and get the data uh, to be received by the correct application. But it's, we call that a connection-less protocol. It's not doing the three-way handshake. It's not doing the error recovery. It's not doing the, the flow control. And so we think about, you know, well, why would we want that then if we, we want to make sure that the, you know, that the data is received properly. Well, a couple of reasons. There's uh, some applications can tolerate the loss of data. Okay, good classic example is voice over IP. Okay, we're calling. We're, we're uh, I mean, just even this uh, this transmission. Uh, you're listening to my voice. You know, maybe you know if uh, you know my my voice might drop. Uh, it might be discernible. It might not. But um, you know, sometimes we're on a call and, and the, the call just goes out for a moment. Okay, that could be a drop packet or, or drop data. Okay, there's no reason then for that data to then be retransmitted and put back in because then you're listening to words that say came you know too late in the, in the uh, you know in the conversation. So it's not going to be resending that because that would just be impractical. But there's also some applications that have uh, error recovery built in say DNS. DNS is uh, very often uses UDP and if I send a request out for a, um, a, you know, a DNS resolution and if I don't get it because maybe the, the, the data got dropped somewhere along the way, well then I'm going to resend my request. There's a, there's a built-in recovery mechanism within the application to, uh, to make sure that if it doesn't receive that data, it's going to, the application itself is going to keep requesting it until it receives that, okay? So the overhead, or the, the header for UDP is eight bytes. It's much smaller than, than, uh, than TCP. So again, that's, that's you know, less bandwidth, less processing overhead. So for such things like VoIP or video streaming, that's great because that means we can send more data and not have to worry about all those error checking mechanisms. Okay. All right, Kyle. Did, did we have any questions? I saw that there were a lot of um, tweets going through, and I hadn't had a chance to, uh, to to follow any of that. Yeah. So we've gotten some creativity as far as the acronyms for the OSI model. Uh, I, I won't Fantastic. repeat them, but uh, if if you are curious, feel free to go out on Twitter and specifically look at Cody Bunch's tweet. Um, and nice. else, okay. <laughs> it, it's extremely interesting. Uh, and then we also had. Well, I've, sorry, go ahead. No, no, I was going to say I, I've been purposely not uh, watching um, uh, as the, the tweets go through on my phone, just because I knew that uh, that would distract. Me. Um, <laughs> so yeah, so I'll have to take a look at this uh, after the call. Uh, and, and then we had a couple uh, questions come in, uh, although they're more statements just to the question box. Uh, with sure. One being that. Uh, VIRL isn't just a resource hog, it's also a money hog. Uh, and the yeah. only place that the OSI model really gets used are on exam questions. 
However, I, I think I'd like to add that it also gets used quite a bit on uh, interview questions too, which is always fun. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and and uh, and I absolutely um, I I can I can partly agree with that, but I think one of the things that I, I was trying to express as I went through this is that that it it is, is can help us uh, understand again the. the the different functions that, that that are going on within the network. When we're talking about layer two or layer three. Well, those are those are OSI layers, right? But it helps us to frame the the functions, frame the the actions that are happening at layer two, because we we have a concept of okay, this is what happens at layer two. All right, switches are you know operate at layer two, and uh, and so I you know so I I, I have to. Um, to agree that usually whenever we, we talk about all the, the layers of the OSI, yes, it's usually in the context of an exam, but for but I, but I think that especially with those those lower four layers, that um, that it can really help us understand and categorize what's going on at you know the you know uh, you know at at various points within the network. So anyway, that's a uh, it's kind of a my opinion on that, but uh, any other any other thoughts or questions there? And we had one other comment in relation to ping, how it uh, how it doesn't have to be just an IP. Uh, Graham used to use it back in the days of IPX and SPX. Ah, oh, yes, yeah, <laughs> sure. <clears throat> yeah, I, I actually um, I, I do remember working with IPX XPX myself. Um, uh, interestingly, I don't remember doing ping with that, so that, that's good to know, though. All right. Well, if, uh, if you guys are ready to move on, I've got uh, I've got two more objectives to hit here in the next five minutes, so I'm going to try to race through the rest of that. Um, <laughs> Lightning round. There we go. Yep. <laughs> so the uh, the next uh, objective here is we're, we're looking at the. Um, uh, so 1.1, we're looking at the network devices, and um, and just a lot of this is just going to be um, just kind of just general. Um, some of this is going to be historical knowledge. Uh, repeaters. Uh, we don't really see repeaters a whole lot, but the whole concept there is it's taking a, a signal uh, from one um, cable segment or one uh, uh, segment on the network, and and then regenerating it. And why is it doing that? Well, you know, cable. Uh, the, the electrical impulses, the, the light pulses that, that go across the, the network media, uh, that tends to weaken as it as it uh, you know goes across the distance of that say that cable. So in order to be able to extend the network, throw a repeater in there, and then that'll continue uh, to allow that signal to uh, to stay at a you know pretty good strong strength. Um, so. That's the concept of repeater. It works at layer one because all it's doing is taking those bits and then just uh, intensifying the, the strength of them and then sending them on their way. Okay. Hub also works at layer one. It's often called a multi-port repeater. Uh, we don't use hubs in, 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 in our networks anymore. We shouldn't be because they're terribly inefficient, uh, meaning that uh, any it, when you've got multiple devices that are hooked into a hub, all of those devices are on a big collision domain. Okay, I'm not going to get too much into what that is. We can talk about that next week. But basically, effectively, what that is is, is each device that's on that collision domain, they, they have to wait their turn. Only one device can talk at a time. So if you've got a lot of devices on that hub, well, you're going to experience some congestion because you know they're all waiting for their, their turn to talk. And, and um, anyway, we, we don't see those often. Um, we really shouldn't see them in, in, in any kind of data center situation uh, at all. So then we move up to layer two. Uh, layer two, we, we start to uh, pull in the, the simplest layer two uh, device, which is your bridge. Um, we really don't see these a whole lot, uh, uh, at least not the, the way that, uh, that they used to. I, I think that. Uh, wireless access, or there, there are wireless bridges, certainly. But um, but as far as the concept of a bridge, really all it was doing is just um, if it had two or four ports, it was just breaking up those collision domains into you know, basically two separate sections, right? So say it's a two-port bridge, you've got um, you've got one 
say a group of work group machines on one side, group of work group machines on the other side. So each one of those, they, there would be, you know, that they, on, on each side, each one of those computers would have to take their turn talking. But the machines on the other side wouldn't have to wait for them because they're on, and they were in their own little collision domain. Okay, you could talk across that. You could send a, um, you know, a, uh, um, you have data across that certainly, but uh, but as long as you were talking to the machines on your own side, you weren't impacting the machines on the other side. So it started to provide a little bit more bandwidth to each of those machines. Layer two switch. Okay, at this point, um, you know we're we're extending that concept of breaking up these collision domains into many many more. So you've got a 48 port hub. I'm I'm sorry, 48 port switch. We have 48 collision domains. Okay, each one of those ports represents another collision domain. Okay, and typically what we have in a switch is um, you know, one device hooked up to each port on a switch. That means it doesn't have to wait for other people to, to or other machines to, to stop talking in order for it to, to, to talk. Okay, so if you've got 48 devices hooked up to a 48 port uh, switch, they can all talk at the same time. Now we do uh, introduce the concept of the broadcast domain. Okay, um, I'll get into that more next week. But uh, but the whole concept here is uh, switches allow uh, you know much much greater bandwidth. Um, we're allowing you know this this is really becomes the building block of our of our networks, our businesses, and our data centers, and um, so and all it's doing is it's looking at the MAC address. As at each frame that comes in, and then forwards that frame out to whichever port has the destination address uh, assigned to it or, or associated to it. Okay, we move up to the router. Router works at layer three. Okay, this is going to break up the broadcast domain, um, and uh, it, of course we know that it connects uh, provides connections to our WAN services, our ISPs, and so forth. Uh, so the various functions of the router, it's okay. It's it's sending those. It's taking those packets and 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 uh, you know sending them to uh, you know the proper uh, proper exit interfaces and uh, it's filtering those packets uh, against its access list. Um, Inter-network communication. Okay, this is where we we have the concept of you've got you know one uh, local area network A, you've got local area network B. Well, it, the router is used to uh, to move data from those two different local area networks. Okay, this is where we enter the concept of VLANs. Um, if we're talking about a say a layer three switch, okay, routing between those um, those different VLANs. Okay, again, we'll get into that next week. Uh, as far as path selection, using the routing table to to determine uh, which uh, which path or what which uh, interface to, to send those packets to the various remote networks. So then we get into the network diagram, and here you see some of the the icons that are used for various devices that we just talked about. You've got the router up there near the cloud. Uh, the one in the middle that's a, that would be a layer three switch. That's Cisco's icon for layer three, or layer three switch. And then uh, the two blue ones down near the bottom, those are your normal layer two switches. Okay, it's important to be able to read a diagram just to. Um, uh, be able to, to see the logical representation of what's happening on your, your network. Of course, we know the diagrams are important for administration, for uh, for troubleshooting. Anytime we're going to do maintenance on the network, we need to know, hey, what's what's this going to impact? What are the dependencies if I take this one switch down? Okay. So now let's get into the topologies. Okay, some of these again were uh, Cisco expects us to know some of these very historical uh, topologies that you know we're not going to see in our in our networks today, but we need to understand the concepts behind them. So we've got the bus topology. Okay, what this was, I say was, is a um, or was a uh, you had a uh, essentially one trunk, and that trunk uh, was was essentially just a, a cable. Uh, that had a terminator on both ends, and you had you know, all of your your network devices uh, hooked into that trunk, either using say vampire caps that were basically clamped into the, the trunk. Uh, I remember the day when I was using uh, BNC T connectors to connect a uh, you know a 
bunch of classroom PCs into the uh, the local bus network. Um, but so this kind of topology, uh, it um, did not allow for um, uh, real um, massive scalability. Uh, problems with this this type of topology is that uh, you know if you, if you needed to say move a computer from one point to another, it was harder to do that. Uh, it didn't allow for great bandwidth. There was uh, you know, all of the machines on this this network had to share the bandwidth. Um, it was just it was uh, it, it was a, a low cost way of putting together a, a network, but certainly not the most efficient. Okay. And we got the ring topology. Okay, so here we've got um, basically it's uh, all of those computers were connected. Um, actually, each one of those machines became part of the network. Okay, so it's not like the bus where the, the machine was connected to the network, or to the cable. The cable actually was uh, was going into one port on the uh, the machine and then going out another port. So, so your machine then became part of that network, meaning that if you took that machine out, then you would be breaking the network. Now, that that's been a problem with uh, ring topology is is uh, the the lack of redundancy and meaning that if, if Again, if you pulled one of those machines out, you're going to take the whole network down. Now, they did mitigate this by creating a dual ring topology that allowed uh, basically a second ring. And, and essentially what was happening here is when we have this ring topology is that data is going around in one particular direction. So if you were to take a node out, then it's going to stop where that break is. You had a dual ring. The data could be traveling in the opposite direction on that second ring. So again, if you take a node out, well then, even though traffic can't can't go any further, it can't go past the break on you know, in one direction, it can still flow the other direction and hit all the other computers that were on the other side of that break. Okay. Um, but again, it's uh, we don't see this in in our local networks now. Um, I think it's still used in some sonic rings, and um, but uh, but it's uh, but it's important though to at least know what that topology uh, was. The ones we see now are these days in our our networks are star topology. Okay, pretty familiar with this uh, uh, this logical view here of you know a switch in the middle and and uh, all your various network devices connected to it. Um, you know it's very scalable. It was e you know it's easy to uh, to plug another device into this network. There are available ports on the switch. You just plug it in. No need to take any other uh, uh, any other uh, device down. And, and when when we're adding uh, new devices to it, it's scalable also from the standpoint that if uh, if we run out of ports on this particular switch, well, we can add another switch to the network and then connect the two together. Okay, so uh, so there, there's 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 great scalability. Um, the only challenge with this particular network is. If you only have one switch and that switch goes down, well, then thus goes the rest of your network. I mean, all of your devices go down. We mitigate this by creating redundant uh, uh, switches. Okay. And then we have our extended star topology. Uh, this is where we really start to scale out, start to expand our network uh, as uh, you know, we, we can, we can uh, attach multiple uh, switches and, and fan them out. and and, and so here we, we start to see, we start to get an idea of, of the, um, you know, the larger networks that we see in, in campuses and um, you know, larger businesses where you've got maybe, a, say, a core switch and then you've got your distribution switches and then below that your access switches and they're, they're all just kind of standing out one from another. So that's really kind of based on that, that whole extended star or that, based on that star topology but extended out. And then we have the, the mesh topology, which is, uh, if, if this were a full mesh topology, then all of those devices would have would be connecting to all of the other devices. Uh, this particular uh, picture that I've got here is not full mesh; it's partial mesh. Two of my devices are not connected to each other, but uh, but we would see this uh, really more often. Um, we'll say in WANs, we would see that if you've got different offices and, and you have multiple uh, connections. Basically, you're, you're creating multiple pathways to each of these connection, connection points. 
Um, so you've got massive uh, redundancy. If one of those points goes down, hey, you still have another path to be able to get to all of the other, other points. Okay. Uh, it is a bit more expensive because of uh, all the additional um, the redundancy that's built into it. Um, but it's a, uh, uh, you know, a, a, again, a very robust uh, topology. Okay, uh, last objective here um, is talking about the uh, various hardware. Now, I'm just going to I'm going to just show you some of the resources on on Cisco's page, uh, Cisco's website, to be able to uh, define some of this information. Um, it's if if you read the forums. You'll, you'll note that uh, a lot of people who have taken this exam, 640911, have, uh, they've been, uh, they've come across very specific questions regarding the, the Nexus hardware specifications. Okay. Um, I'm not going to go through that, uh, you know, line by line. That's something that, that you'll just have to, to go through, uh, take a look at the, the, the different, uh, pages on, on Cisco's site, the different product pages, look at the, the differences between the different models. It's, I think it's surprising that for an exam that is really focused on kind of the, the intro to networking, also will potentially be testing you on some of just some of the, the hardware specs of the different Nexus um, uh, product models. Okay, um, but they do, and so so it's important to remember this. It's important to go through this. It's probably just going to be a matter of a lot of memorization. Um, it's important to know the licensing behind all of this, and so to go through this, I'm just going to point out some of these uh, some of these resources. So there is uh, Cisco.com/go/nexus. If we go here, we'll pull up. The landing page for uh, Cisco's data center switches. And then, if we go down here to the products and services tab and then expand the switches portfolio, we can see some of the, the different the, uh, the different models of the various data center switches. So the 9K, the 7K, 6K, and so forth. And so for any one of these, you can pull up the, the data sheet, and it'll give you plenty of data for each, each one of those devices. What I think is really neat, though, is the uh, Cisco switch selector option here. So if we just go, this is the data center exam, so we're going to look at the data center switches. And let's take a look at, we're going to check out the, uh, the different LAN switches. And let, let's see what they have as far as their core LAN switches. Okay. So we're talking about the, the 7K series or the 9K series. We're looking at ACI. And then if we want to get more information on any, say, the, the 7K, then, then we can pull up uh, various information, various uh, white papers and uh, data sheets, and we can even compare the different models. We can look at the speeds and the uh, basically the, the, the number of supports and uh, the, the different modules that uh, that each of those uh, or the, the, the chassis can hold, uh, and so, but it's going to be important to, uh, to 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 get a good idea of the differences and the, the different models. Um, now, a, a number of uh, comments on the uh, the forums of it seems to, to have centered around the 7K, so the 7K might be the, the ones that might need to focus on a little bit more. Um, but, but I just wanted to draw your attention to, uh, to where you can find this information. Okay, it's not, I don't think it's going to help me to, to go through this when, when you pull that up and, and then just have to commit some of this to memory. Um, but some of the other sources, well, here the, here's the, uh, the 7K series data sheet. Um, let me pull that up. Here is... This, this is a, a great resource here. This is, uh, this is from Wendell Odom's uh, official cert certification guide. And this particular appendix is actually freely available from the Cisco Press uh, site. So if we click on that and open that up, there's a lot of information here. 
but again, it's it's information that that you will need to know in order to be able to pass this first exam. Um, and so, anyway, I, I throw that out as, as another good resource to, to look through, uh, to get to know, get to know the different uh, technology, um, the, the specifications for each of those models. Um, and then as far as the licensing guide, you can pull that up. That goes to the licensing for, for the different uh, models. And then interestingly, somebody, actually a couple of people had noted that uh, there's there's um, one particular video. So if you go to CVP Nuggets, if you've got the, their subscription, there's the 640-916 the course. Okay, that's the, that's the second of the two exams that you need to pass in order to be able to achieve your, your CCNA data center. Well, video three in that series is very applicable to these hardware specs that you need for 640-911. And I think the reason that um, that uh, they, th those hardware specs were typically thought to have, have fit better in the, the 916 uh, exam, but the, uh, the blueprint used to not have the uh, the exam objective items uh, 1.2.b and 1.2.c, the Nexus hardware specs and the, the licensing requirements. But people were blindsided by this information showing up on the exam. And so Cisco had added those, those uh, objectives to this blueprint to make sure that you uh, understand that, that you need to know that information. So even though it seems like it's more concepts for the, the 916, Cisco has decided that you're going to need to know that for uh, 911. So, um, so I, I, I throw those resources out to you to uh, to make sure that you've got a good understanding of what uh, each of those different models, um, the different specs, and the differences between each. So, any questions at this point? Graham just wanted to add that uh, the Nexus 7Ks, you know, that what you need to know about those is that you need a half rack, deep pockets, and your own power station to run it. I'm thinking that won't be in the data sheet, but so true. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And you need a good, um, a good uh, server lift, um, one of those uh, little scissor lifts to be able to, to, uh, to get it into your rack. Those things are, are, uh, are pretty heavy. They're beasts. Yep. All righty. Well, guys, that's it for me. That's that's all the data that I've got to give to you. So I'm going to terminate my connection here. Um, but I, I appreciate uh, I appreciate your all's attention. Um, sorry, we went over quite a bit here. Um, I'll try to keep my next week lesson uh, you know, within the uh, within the hour. Uh, but I, I do appreciate everybody's attention, our comments, your questions, and uh, yeah, this was a lot of fun. No worries, we we definitely enjoyed it. And uh, cool. Graham, cool. Graham even mentioned that uh, he'd rather you go over than go fast. I definitely agree with that. Fantastic, awesome, it's great, then, great. Then we also had one interesting uh, entry for the acronyms again. Uh, this one, an Aussie version, which is the Australia Post never delivers parcels. So very interesting. We're we're getting uh, worldwide now. Nice. That's great. <laughs> awesome. Awesome. Very cool. Well, that's so, exciting. So Good Brian, right. thank you again. I am going to. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Thanks, guys. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you.